Okay, Roger once again, Mud Fossil University, and today we're going to be talking about neutrons. And my contention is that neutrons do not exist. Neutrons, you don't see them rolling around on the floor by themselves. They're always uh, solidly attached to positives. So they're obviously not neutral. All right, so what, what is the other possibility? Well, what if they were all electrons flooding that nucleus? And the, which would, is exactly what I would expect to happen. A battery, you take a positive and you put it onto a negative and you, they're solidly attached. So I would assume that there's a ton of these little guys. They're 1,800 times smaller than the protons. But there would be a ton of them flooding in here causing a, a, a magnetic array, literally. And they would first try to surround each one of these and then they would surround this whole mass and they would be like a snowball full of marbles. And the snow would be the, the, the electrons, and the marbles would be the protons. And they would be solidly attached. They call it the strong nuclear force, and they have all these words and things, and up and down charm, and strange, and love. And I mean, it's just, they're trying to make something work that just isn't, this is silly. They, these are attached to electrons. It's a flood. Now, what would happen after the flood? There would be so much electron negativity in here that the ones more want to come in. They say, whoa, 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 you guys can't come in here. And they say, well, why not? He said, we got tons of electrons in here. We don't need you. He goes, what do you want us to do? We'll just stay where you are. Stay out there. And more guys will come in, and they'll try to bump you out of the way. Just keep them away, too. So you get one here and one here, and then that'll, that'll push exactly to here and exactly to there and exactly to here. And then you arrive. That's how you achieve your orbitals. And I, I'm working on the, the nuclear configuration of the electrons in this core because this is a bit of a problem um, trying to figure out how they stack up and what the exact arrangement of them would be the assembly be, and there will be an assembly of them because it, it's, it's it, it absolutely happens and I can show you in magnetic um, toys really they, they they show them stacking right up in circles around the nucleuses of, of magnets and uh, they, they will take on a pattern, and that's what the quantum distance is. All right, so they, they will be the number of protons will be have a certain magnetic value. The number of electrons will also have a certain magnetic value, and it will be an exact magnetic value depending upon the quantity of protons. Then the excessive negativeness that will invade. It will try. There will there'll be little extra ones in here that'll be trying to get in, and it won't let them. That's when they stay out in their orbitals. All right. So that's what I'm saying is the construction of complete matter. Now, what is not complete matter? Complete matter is the electrons. And where are the electrons? They're floating around everywhere. They're all over you. They're all over me. They're all over every single surface there is. And they are in the air. And they are attached to water molecules and other molecules as static electricity. That is literally the ether. And that is what we've been missing, is the ether. And the ether is completely pre prevailing in, in every place in space where light has reached because the ether is these freed electrons from the sun they're thrown out of there at escape velocity as electrons they're floating through space staying away from each other because they have the same force charge carrier and they repel each other at a certain distance and John Glenn saw him he said they're seven or eight feet apart something like that and they are brilliant bright little particles and they are in our ionosphere and that is why they that's our magnetic field and the reason the ionosphere collects so many electrons is because the earth's core is already flooded exactly like this so uh, above so below <laughs> all right so below is here and they can't get in so above is the earth and they're trying to get in and it's at a certain level at at a distance out there, after you get past all of the matter, it's literally just a soup of electrons saying, I want to get in there, I want to get in there. It says, no, we got plenty. Stay where you are. That's our, our ionosphere. And what does that do? That's our magnetic field. All right? That's a big minus charge around the surface of the Earth, around uh, you know, the atmosphere. I think it goes, it's, it's a big, a wide swath. Around, surrounding the Earth, it goes away. I think it goes all the way out to 630 miles or something like that, uh, of this negative particle 
concentration. And that is our magnetic field. All right? It fluctuates dependent because the Earth is, as the Earth spins, it obviously has an effect on the magnetic field. Any spinning or moving particle creates a magnetic field around it. And we have photographed them. All right, this is extremely simple. The atomic bomb is a compression of all the electrons in and compressing into the nuclear forces. When it lets loose, all of the electrons come out in a brilliant flash of light, which is what you would expect. All, everything becomes polarized in the air. And as that mass now has lost its electrons, literally all of them, as much as I can determine, or, or most of them, it becomes highly positive pushing away from the positive pull of the Earth and goes straight up in the air. That's what a nuclear blast is. Here comes all the radiation. All right, I'm going to have it take off right now. Boom. The bomb goes off. All of that electrons now, that's all electrons. And of course the shock wave. They've impacted with all the um, um, moisture in the atmosphere. Now the core is being pushed being pushed off the earth. That's not blowing up there by accident. That is being pushed away magnetically. And as it goes, it's sucking everything it can. Now it's expelled all of its electrons. Now it's trying to pull everything back into itself to reconstruct its normal matter. That is gravity. That's anti-gravity. All right, this is Expersion Alien XX UFO and NASA Unexplained Tether Overload Incident. Now, they're going to see all the light particles showing up in the background. They have no clue what they are, and they don't know how to deal with them. They don't know how to explain them, so they're just being quiet about it and sort of trying to, to, to slide it off on the side. Listen to what he says about coming into daylight. Now, listen. Check these particles out. Some of them actually interact right with this. These are the light, and he's not talking because they this don't know what. Are showing, a... showing they don't know what to say now. Look at them. The satellite. Again, uh, just moving into sunrise. That's the key right there, just moving into sunrise. That is when they become visible. Now you'll see some go real fast. Those, I believe, are, are not just light particles. The ones that are just floating around out here and the big blobby ones that are floating through are, are light particles. Now they're going to try to see... 81 nautical miles. They're trying to adjust it out. They, they can't adjust out these because they are light. They're coming into the sunrise, and as soon as they hit sunrise, they're washed out. They can't see them anymore. But until then, this, this is light. They, these, these are light particles. This is our ionosphere. This is our protection, our solar magnetic field. And, I mean, th these are the particles that, that concentrate out there. Gravity is totally misunderstood. Light is totally misunderstood. It's not goes the same speed all the time. All right, it's time to look into, you know, go to Mud Fossil University, look into the Higgs fields and unified field and all that stuff we have up there. And it's all shown in pictures as well, and not just theory. All right, this is from Mars Moon Space TV. This is when John Glenn went up and he describes fireflies when he's going up through the atmosphere. And he's, he's just in awe because he can't believe what he's seeing. And here's what he says. This is what he, he actually reported as he was going up through the ionosphere, actually encountering light. They lit up like they're luminescent. I've never saw anything like it. They're around the little, they're coming by the capsule, uh, and they look like little stars, a whole shower of them coming by. Uh, they swirl around the capsule and go in front of the window, and they're all brilliantly lighted. Uh, they probably average maybe... Uh, seven or eight feet apart. That's exactly what would happen. It's exactly what you expect. They are brilliant little pieces of energy. And they want to get to the Earth, but they can't. They're interacting with the ionosphere, and they're being held there. They're seven or eight feet apart. That's because they have their own same charges. They stay apart. He's, he's seeing this, and he's reporting this the first time ever. But I can see them all. 
fall down below me also. They asked him if he could hear him impacting the capsule or, you know, what are actually particles that he, and he can't see any, he can't feel any impacts or hear any clicking or anything. Yeah, they're very slow. Uh, they're not going away from me more than maybe uh, uh, three or four miles per hour. They're you see that? That's a lot. That, yeah, and there's some of them, you see, some of them will come through real fast. Those are the heavy particles, I believe. These are the electrons who cannot get into the Earth because we got too many electrons already. They're going at the same speed I am, approximately. They're only very slightly under my speed. Over. All right, he's lost contact with with um, ground control here because he is in the ion ionosphere and it's completely uh, destroys all the electronic signals. Now, this is. To me, it's obviously proof, and the tether experiment, uh, the tether incident, encountered this exact same situation, and the exact same time of the day is when light rises, or the day or the night, you have to get, it. and the same thing with our experiments, if you don't get it in the exact correct light, you cannot see these particles, but in the correct plane of light, they become just completely obvious, and you'll hear them say about the sunrise. What do you see? Uh, they, do, they do have a different motion, though, from me, uh, because they swirl around the capsule and then depart uh, back the way that I am looking. Are you receiving? Over. They can't hear. There are literally thousands of them. Uh, this is Friendship 7. Uh, am I in contact with anyone? Over. I honestly really just can't hear Hear that buzziness? Uh, this has been going on since about 1 uh, plus 1 5. Over. Just after I remarked about the sunset, I looked back. There it is right there. Just after he remarked about the sunset. As soon as you have a, a diffusion of light, there's a certain range of light where these will show up brilliantly and I mean fabulously. Now I'm going to show you what happened in the tether incident. Same same story little particles they had no clue what to say about them and the same thing here John Glenn they just forget about them because they, they, they don't know what to say but these are light particles and they're collecting in our ionosphere because the earth has already accepted as much elect electrical uh, electrons as it, it, can, it can use you know, it, it, they're being forced into the earth. That's why you feel heat. When, you, when, the, when light comes in and it forces itself through the atmosphere into the earth, it is literally forcing itself against other fields that say, stay out here. It says, no, I'm coming in. I'm powerful enough to come in and push you out of the way. I know you're going to heat up. I know I'm going to make you hot, but I don't care. And when I do, I'm going to make you really hot because I'm going to shake you like crazy and I know there's going to be light emitted from you as well because you're going to be shooting off electrons because I am strong and I'm coming through that atmosphere. Now the other ones are just lingering out there. They're the, they're the slackers. <laughs> they're out there just hanging out, hoping to get in. You know, like one of those guys hanging around on the outside said, maybe I can horn in on something. You know what I mean? And that's what these guys are in the ionosphere. The rest of them come through in a direct ray of light towards the earth. And that's what will happen as soon as he gets into the sun, sunrise. And he says it. He says, now I'm in the brightness and I, they're, they're gone. Well, obviously they're gone because it's flooded. And he can't see in them anymore. Not in the darkness. Now, if you want to find out more about uh, the research we've done here, this is up on uh, Mud Fossil University and the Higgs field we've seen shown d dividing. Actually, the Higgs field can divide when they impact with each other. Uh, unified theory works. It all works out fine once you get rid of uh, the Einstein yeah, part of it. And that is literally, that's literally two impacting fields. You see these fields here? This is a highly accelerated one. And as it crashes into another field, it is stepping down and releasing a portion of a field. So light can be divided. Light can be accelerated. Light can be divided. It's it's uh it's it's uh it's really not that complicated once you get away from this neutron theory, and you get away from the uh, you can't 
there's a, there's a speed limit on light. I'm going to tell you what, let me show you what John Glenn said about light. 